of those per day. And that's because refined grains are the only ones that are enriched and fortified with B vitamins and iron and folate. And because we limit the foods like meat, dairy, where those vitamins occur, those nutrients occur naturally, the government has to require that you have three servings of those refined enriched grains every day to get those nutrients. You might also notice that you're supposed to be having 27 grams of vegetable oil every day. Um, okay, this is a chart that takes a while to, to sink in and I'm not going to go through all of it, but it is the way to explain why the dietary guidelines are so influential. I know nobody thinks that they go to a .gov website to find out about how to eat healthy and probably very few people in the room, but this is how they affect your loved ones, your office workers, the people around you, you before you found the low carb diet. They influence all, especially over here um, on what I think is your left-hand side, but the USDA feeding programs, so the school lunches for your kids, feeding programs for the elderly, food in your nursing home uh, for of elderly uh, relatives, the women and infant children program, all of that is driven by the guidelines. The, the food stamp was now called SNAP program. They, they, they drive all the education for that, telling those people what to eat. Um, so, and that is a huge population. It's the, it's a billion dollars a year that is spent on those feeding programs and they reach one and four Americans in every month. Um, so it's also, they influence K through 12 education, what is taught in schools, how to eat healthy. And it's virtually, the guidelines are virtually downloaded by all professional associations you see there. So all doctors, nurses, nutritionists, dietitians, when you go to those offices and ask, how do you eat healthy? They deliver to you the guidelines. Um, and so you get them there. So every office across the country is giving you the guidelines. Hospitals follow them. The military follows them. They're, they are what determine if when you take a buy, uh, food something in a package and you flip it over and look at the fact food fact panel, that's all determined by the guidelines. Meat has all been bred to be leaner across the country. And if you look across the bottom of this chart, it just shows you how, how well these guidelines have done for all these populations, which is that, um, that they're now suffering overwhelmingly from metabolic disease. Um, this is a chart just to show you that the, the main argument that is used uh, when, when I talk about the guidelines is people will say, well, people don't follow the guidelines anyway, so why do you, uh, why do you even bother talking about them? This is the best available data on food availability, and there's something very simple, sim similar on food consumption in America where they adjust for loss, and these charts are the same. And they're not based on food frequency questionnaires, which are an unreliable form of data. This is really based on the food supply. It comes from USDA data. They've been doing this for years. And it shows since 1970 that in every category we've been told to eat more of, we do eat more of. Fruits, vegetables, grains, vegetable oils, all of those we eat significantly more of. And we've reduced everything we've been told to reduce. Whole milk is down by 70%. Red meat is down by 28%. Beef is down by 35%, eggs, animal fats, butter, all down. So these are large trends in the changes of the way Americans eat, all consistent with the guidelines. Um, and this is what the guidelines lead to. These are some pictures of things that you can eat in schools. Um, and um, I have many pictures like this. These are the kinds of things you get in hospitals. There's a great picture of somebody who asked for uh, fruit to be served at their hospital, and they got um, a little box of uh, of Fruit Loops that were fruit colored, <laughs> Fruit Loop cereal. Um, so the guidelines allow these because they allow refined grains and they allow sugar. Ten percent of calories is sugar. These are also some of the things that are allowed by the guidelines. So you can get Mountain Dew Kickstart. Uh, and, but you cannot get whole milk. And PepsiCo 
has an entire website called K through 12 passion to please, where they have all the different foods that you can get if you are running a school lunch program. Um, there are three really major issues with the dietary guidelines that I've been focused on. Uh, and that I think you should be focused on too, as people who are affected by them. Uh, and, um, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. I don't want to take tons of time, but um, one is that they is they they fail to review the science properly, uh, and that's why they're so wrong in many ways. Um, the other is that they are this year reconsidering the cap on saturated fats, and I think that many people know that the the limiting saturated fats as we've been doing is something that is not based on good evidence. And then finally, there's a big effort this year to try to get low-carb diet as one option in the dietary guidelines for people with, at least for people with metabolic disease. Okay, so how are we doing on these issues? Um, well, proper reviews of the science. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, no less, the highest scientific body in the land, came out with this consensus report that was mandated by Congress. Congress allocated a million dollars for this report. Uh, that was largely in part of work that uh, my group did, the Nutrition Coalition. We pushed pretty hard for this. The report came out in 2017, and it said unequivocally, these are just two quotes I could have pulled many more that the current process for reviewing the science really falls short of meeting best practices for conducting systematic reviews. In fact, they said they, uh, they really were not systematic in the way they were reviewing the science. Well, what does that mean to be systematic? Well, I think many of you know that there are different uh, qualities of science. There is more rigorous science there at the top of that pyramid, and then there's less rigorous science down at the bottom. So this is a fairly traditional chart, and I don't agree with everything on this chart, but I'm, I'm, I wanted to use something that would be widely recognizable. Like, for example, I don't agree that expert opinion should be at the very bottom of this chart. Uh, however, um, all systems of systematic review, meaning when you bring together all the evidence on a subject and you review it, how do you go about sorting through papers? What's more important? What's less important? All systems for these internationally recognized systems for review prioritize randomized controlled clinical trials or just controlled clinical trials, which is a type of evidence that shows cause and effect, right? So that's that light orange bar second from the top. These trials are able to demonstrate causation. So you cannot go and get a pill from your pharmacist unless that pill has been through a trial, a trial where they test the pill and they give some people a placebo, and then they follow those people for a period of time to see what the effect of the pill is compared to the control group, which takes the placebo. You can do these kinds of trials in diet too. They're not as easy to do, but you can do them. And it's the only type of evidence that shows causation. A far lower quality of evidence is called observational studies. That's the light green bar and below that case, uh, sorry, just the light green bar. That is a very weak kind of science, shows only association. I think you had another lecture on this, so I'm not going to go into it in too much more detail. But just to say that there are internationally recognized systems to review the data so there, you may recognize some of the names. Cochrane is one of them. GRADE is another one used by 150 public health institutions around the world. There's something the U.S. developed called AHRQ, another system. They, all of them, prioritize data coming from randomized controlled trials over observational studies. And that is the correct way to do it. So what does... The USDA do the agency in charge of the dietary guidelines. Instead, they follow in the footsteps of Jeremiah Stamler, who is at Northwestern University and a close colleague of Ansel Keys, who used this tragic phrase, which is that we should just put all the evidence together in a big mosh pit and look at the preponderance of the evidence and not prioritize studies. So what that means, this is... Actually, what the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee is doing, they'll say, we found 35 studies 
and we put them all together. And they really do not prioritize the randomized controlled clinical trials over the observational studies. And they'll just say, so in many cases, they'll just say, well, we had so many observational studies that said this, but then we only had two clinical trials saying something different. So we're going with the preponderance of the evidence, which means just the, the, the greater number of studies, even though it's the weakest kind of evidence. So this is something that really is um, a huge problem with the guidelines. In fact, when I went through and looked through all the evidence base, every single study for all the key recommendations in the guidelines for the dietary patterns, for the saturated fat reviews, what I came to understand is that the vast majority of evidence underpinning our guidelines is all it all comes from epidemiological studies or observational studies. The fact to remember about those studies is that they're a weak form of data. They show association only. When they are tested in clinical trials, they are shown to be correct 0 to 20% of the time. That means that 80 to 100% of the time, they're wrong. And 80 to 100% of the time, well, let's say 0 to 20% of the time is those are not good odds on which to base the public health. Um, okay, so let's move on to the review on saturated fats. First, a kind of a shout out to all of you who may have contributed public comments to the USDA to get this topic back into consideration for this round of the dietary guidelines. We had thousands of people write to the USDA, submit public comments to say, we want a review of low fat, di uh, sorry, low carb diets and saturated fats. And that may be one reason that they decided to reevaluate the data on saturated fats, which was a really good start. Unfortunately, it hasn't turned out that well. Um, this chart just shows you, this is the very first dietary guidelines when the program was launched in 1980, and it just shows you that the saturated fat limit goes back to the very beginning. And this uh, initially, it was just avoid too much fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol, and there was no specific limit. In 2005, they started imposing a specific percentage limit, which was 10% of calories, 10% of energy as saturated fats. And then they sort of moved to a model in 2015 or maybe 2010 even where they said it, the important thing is to replace saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats. So replace butter with margarine. Make sure you get those 27 grams of soybean oil every day. <clears throat> um, and that 10% number, of course, is not justified by any experiment or trial or any any reference at all it's just sort of a number that has been picked out of thin air um so this of course flies in the face of this there there has been over the last 20 years really um well say sorry um there's been over the last 10 years, starting with a paper by Ron Krauss in 2010, but before that, by the work of Gary Taubes, really looking at the many of the original trials on saturated fats that took place in the 1960s and 70s, people have gone back and looked at those trials. And there have now been uh, over 17 meta-analyses of all those trials, trials where they looked at saturated fats and they tested them to see if they caused heart disease. Because remember, the American Heart Association started recommending against saturated fats back in 1961, but there had been no clinical trials on them. So governments all over the world undertook these large clinical trials on more than 75,000 people altogether, just a massive quantity of data they took saturated fats, they replaced them with polyunsaturated fats, they replaced the butter with the margarine, they had soy-filled milk, soy-filled burgers. Those clinical trials have never been reviewed by any dietary guideline committee. So papers uh, uh, from researchers all over the world started to go back and look at that data. There were 17 minute analysis. This, this, what you're looking at right now, is what's called an umbrella analysis where it reviews all the 17 meta-analyses and tries to come to some conclusion about what they all say. Uh, this is not the only such umbrella analysis. There are now three of them. 
And the conclusion is, as you can see, we probably got it wrong on saturated fats. Um, that replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats does not convincingly reduce cardiovascular events or mortality. I should add, they also do not reduce total mortality. So we must consider that the diet heart hypothesis, that's the hypothesis that says that saturated fats and, and cholesterol cause heart disease, we must consider that that hypothesis is invalid or requires modification, which is maybe putting it generously. Let's just say it's probably invalid. Um, so there have been several papers saying this. And uh, what we did, the Nutrition Coalition did, is we put together an expert workshop. This was just last month in February, where we invited the following really uh, very prominent, mostly uh, quite mainstream scientists to Washington to say, would you like to review the evidence on saturated fats and see what kind of consensus statement you could come to? Uh, not too long ago, in 2019, a group of mainly European scientists went through a similar exercise, and they published a paper in the BMJ stating that the saturated fats that the WHO, the World Health Organization, was looking at were really not justified by the science. And we thought, what if we did the same exercise here in the United States? And uh, so we brought together this group. They had a two-day workshop. They came out with a consensus statement that said um, the following, we respectfully request that the USDA HHS give serious and immediate consideration to lifting the limits placed on saturated fat intake for the upcoming 2020 dietary guidelines. This request is based on a review of the most rigorous scientific data available. Broadly speaking, uh, we concluded that the best and most updated science fails to support the current limits on consuming these fats. This group is publishing their consensus statement in a medical journal currently, which will, of course, have references. They made, they submitted a public comment to the USDA with their findings, and they also wrote a letter to the secretaries of USDA and HHS about their views. Uh, and so, uh, and because it's such a prominent group of scientists, there, uh, there was, it seems, a need to really reckon with what they were saying. If anybody wants to see the consensus statement or the letter to the secretaries, you can go to the website, which I'll show at the end, which is the Nutrition Coalition website. Um, here's what the Committee on Dietary Fats said on Friday, that there is strong evidence demonstrating that replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats reduces the risk of cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality, and the grade was strong. Um, this is somewhat astonishing in that they seem to have ignored all the evidence that has emerged over the last 10 years, including this important consensus statement by their colleagues. And uh, this is what followed in the discussion was even worse. Linda Van Horn, a, Northwest, a professor at Northwestern who studied with Jeremiah Stamler, Remember that quote about the preponderance of the evidence? That was her mentor at Northwestern. She said we should lower the caps on saturated fats even more. She wants to bring it down to 7%, which is what the American Heart Association recommends at the time. Uh, sorry, recommends now. Jamie Ard, another member, said, why don't we just reduce saturated fats down to zero? I hope you're laughing out there. <laughs> Since saturated fats is not an essential nutrient, he said. Jamie Ard, by the way, it's important to mention, is a medical director for Optifast for Nestle and has uh, close connections to the Nestle Corporation, whose foods are um, are all starting with sugar, sugary milk for toddlers and maybe infants. Um, continue on through. Um, the junk food aisles of all supermarkets. So this is really quite astonishing, I think, that they are not only not considering lifting the caps on saturated fats, they're considering pushing them even lower. 
And I should say that there was another committee member, Rick Mattis, who's not on this subcommittee, but he's part of the larger committee. And he said, what about that report, that expert report, the one that I just mentioned that had been submitted as a public comment, so the committee knew about it. And he said, what about that report? That seems like data that we ought to consider. And Linda Van Horn and a couple of other members of the subcommittee basically waved it away. They just said, well, we, uh, we already considered that data or that data is too confounded or um, uh, somebody made the point that the data was confounded by refined carbohydrates when in fact, none of those clinical trials looked at refined carbohydrates. They had simply swapped saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats. So they just dismissed the findings of uh, that expert workshop. Somebody did say, and I think it's a legitimate point, that there had been no references to the consensus statement, but there will be references when that paper is published, which will hopefully come out soon online. Anyway, this was, I think, an astonishing outcome. Given that the science has really increasingly questioned saturated fats and challenged their limits, and there is clearly an a, legitimate and open scientific dispute about these fats. And this, this committee is acting as if there is no dispute and that the cap should be actually be lowered. Okay, more news on the low carbohydrate diet. This is another topic that where there initially I felt great enthusiasm because again, we had thousands of people writing in to say, this needs to be a topic for review for the 2020 guidelines. I need to tell you that a little story that in the last set of guidelines in 2015, they did a review of low carbohydrate diets. We found this out from Freedom of Information Act requests where we obtained access to the emails from the 2015 advisory committee We found that they had done a review of low carbohydrate diets, but that they had uh, basically stuffed it in the methodology section of the report rather than in the diet section of the report where it belongs. By putting it in the methodology section, it assured that nobody would take it seriously as a diet. And the committee said in that report that they uh, couldn't find information about the low carb diet at the time, even though there were more than 60 clinical trials when they made that statement. And one of the members in this email chain that we got access to actually was Frank Hu from Harvard. He pipes up and he says, I don't think we should be burying the data in the methodology section because it is a large and important body of scientific literature. It seems to show uh, quite a great effect for metabolic health, or maybe he said obesity, and then he was ignored. And so, <clears throat> um, so the low carb diet never saw the light in the in the 2015 report. So, <clears throat> so now, what about for 2020? It's an actual question. It's above board question. We know it's happening. Um, and what is their response? How did they review the low carbohydrate diet? Well, Jamie Ard again, our Nestle. Um, medical director said they had, for some reason, they decided to exclude all the low carb studies on weight loss with no explanation in a, in a country where obesity, two thirds of us are overweight, have overweight or obesity. It seems inexplicable why they would exclude all the studies on weight loss, but they did. Um, Ard also saw, said that he's thought that the data on low carb was fairly limited. Uh, and he said that they could find no studies below 25% of carbs, uh, 25% of energy as carbohydrates. Why could they not find those studies? When we did uh, a review, uh, we found 52 such studies. And, um, and there are many studies at about 30% of calories uh, as carbohydrates. So again, it just seems as if we are looking at a potential cover-up of, I mean, maybe that's too strong a word, but I I think, or a a mass exclusion of data on low-carbohydrate diets. Um, He also said changes below 45%, 
meaning 45% of calories is carbohydrates, do not seem to be beneficial. <clears throat> so those are really astonishing statements, I think. They're, they're false. Um, they're clearly false. And I don't know where they're looking for the data, but they're clearly not looking at any of the review papers that have come out many, many review papers that have come out or the trials that have been individually published over the last um, 15, 20 years now. So the committee decided they were not going to release their results on low-carb diets at the meeting on this, uh, this was on Thursday, even though this is the last public meeting. So there's going to be no chance for there to be any public response to whatever they do release. They're going to, they will come out. The next step is for them to come out with their draft report uh, on May 11th. And uh, by then, it'll sort of be a done deal. So there's no opportunity for the public to respond to their analysis of low-carb diets. So I hope you're as um, surprised, perhaps outraged, shocked as I am about all of this. We have really been working hard. My group, the Nutrition Coalition, has been working hard. And when I mean people ask us what we do to work, we do have people who try to uh, talk to members of Congress, try to get them interested in this um, issue. We are also starting a new program to try to get people involved. It is not yet up on this website, but I will hope you will go to this website and sign up for our newsletter. And then we will announce when we have a section of our newsletter where you can take action and call your congressman to say, you know, these issues are important to me. The reviews are not happening, prop happening properly. The review, especially on saturated fats, is excluding evidence. It's so important to get involved. I want to just give you a picture of why that's important because if I go and talk to somebody on Capitol Hill or, or the people that we're working with do, what we often hear is, uh, as staff members on the Hill say, well, we understand the issues, we get it, we understand the science is wrong, but we need to hear from more people. I'm not getting calls at my office. I don't understand that this is really an issue. I need to be hearing from people. And so far, they've only been hearing from people in the uh, meat and dairy industry, which is important because those industries are affected by this, um, un, this science that is really misguided. But those are also, they, I think they also need to hear from real people and from scientists and from doctors and from PhDs and from anybody who is considered disinterested, who doesn't, who won't profit from this, uh, from these, from the dietary guidelines being improved, but just have a personal interest in the science being right. So I hope you'll go back. I hope you will consider calling your representative, writing a letter to them, getting involved in a major way. They really need to hear from people like you. And I want to tell you about another group that has launched called the Low Carb Action Network. And this group is, they do have their call your member of Congress page set up. They're more organized than we are. And this is what it looks like. This group has only one Aim, and that is to get a low carb dietary pattern, a true low carb diet, which we would define as 25% of calories or less. Not everybody's definition, but pretty widely accepted in the field. To get a true low carb dietary pattern accepted as just one option in the dietary guidelines. So, not to get rid of the dietary guidelines, but just to say, let us add this pattern to your existing patterns for people who need it. The effect of that would be to remove the stigma and the taboo from the low carb diet. Many doctors are afraid to practice it. Some, some doctors are prohibited from practicing it. And this would allow it to just be one evidence-based option that would be available for the medical community. Medical community. It could really then become available in schools, nursing homes, hospitals. All of that would be very important. So. Um, Sign up for the Low Carb Action Network. I think Rod may have, have put up a slide about this before, but you can go to this website and sign up to be a member. You can also share your story. Here is some of you know Amy Igus, um, who has shared her stories. We have a bunch of 
stories on the on the website and um they're all i think endlessly inspiring but um but we have also also on this website i don't have a picture here now but is when you things you can take to your doctor right? what is low carb what is the definition what is the quantity of data behind it um what is the american diabetes now saying association now saying about low carb so all of this is now on this website and it's specifically to advocate for low carb. Um, and that's it. That is my whistle stop tour through the dietary guidelines. I think the bottom line was, is we were optimistic. We are not so much any longer and we need your help. <laughs> so thank you for listening.